by a, a, a question and answer session. Um, but I'll hand over immediately to, to the first, and it's a joint presentation by Peniel, Asa, and Anton. And um, they'll be talking about the bival value chain, and they are waiting on my right here, and I'll let them take over immediately. Yes, uh, thank you uh, so much. Uh, we will be three presenters at this uh, presentation. I will start, and my name is Penelope Nielsen, and I'm from DTU in Denmark. Then Osa will come. She's from IBL in Sweden. And then uh, Anton will finalize everything, uh, and he's from uh, CISIC in Spain. Yes. Um, so uh, the overall aim for this uh, bi valve bi value change, I will get on a stumble on that <laughs> 10 times during this presentation, <laughs> uh, is uh, sustainability in terms of both uh, environmentally and sustainability, but also in terms of economic sustainability. We have focused on uh, existing species that is already cultivated in agriculture across the Atlantic, mainly the blue mussel and different oyster species. Uh, but even though that they have been cultured for many years across the Atlantic, there are still some challenges and need and uh, room for improvements within the agriculture uh, production. And uh, one of them is to ensure that you have an upscaled and stable seed production for the different species but also that you have a good production system that are fitted to local conditions, both in terms of grow out nurseries and processes. Uh, <clears throat> but another point is that uh, to increase the sustainability of the value chain, you can start using the bite products, which in this case will be the shells. So uh, hopefully, that was the intention with this case study that after we have looked into all these different things, we would have a sustainable production and a viable business uh, uh, of uh, low trophic agriculture species that has already been uh, produced. To do this, uh, we uh, used uh, known uh, processes and methods that was approved and adapted to local conditions, but we were also looking into uh, making the businesses more resilient in terms of uh, adding more species or making the species more, oh, sorry, the production uh, focusing on more species than just a single species, make it more resilient. And uh, a lot of it was based on tech transfer and knowledge transfer between the regions going both ways uh, and uh, having an innovative approach uh, by using these uh, shells as a byproduct in uh, different ways that Anton will tell you about. And all this should hopefully aid in to uh, help uh, with an ecosystem-based management approach of the uh, low trophic agriculture uh, uh, production. So we start off with the case study about offshore mussel production. And here we have identified three different challenges. One of them is to have a stable uh, seed supply. And therefore, we focused on developing a hatchery protocol uh, when you go out in offshore areas, you have different environmental conditions, so there's a different requirements for the production systems that you use. And therefore, the focus was to develop a submerged system. Uh, here, we focused on a tube and net system. And then uh, the final one was to look into uh, biofouling, uh, because in different areas, you have different bi biofouling issues. And we wanted to be sure that we could make a protocol to remove some of these biofouling organisms. The partners within the Aquavitae project was uh, more or less all in Europe. And I couldn't have done the case study here without all the great uh, collaborators uh, with the Colin from ATU and Iola from Cotton Project Selfish and Rosa <laughs> as well. And also all uh, uh, Bohus Hausbrook from Sweden. Uh, Along the way, of course, other synergies and the connections was made. And as you can see, connections to South African partners within the Aquavitae project and also Brazilian partners uh, emerged. Uh, furthermore, we had three really nice contributors within the industry reference group, which was uh, two Danish companies, Musholm and Katamini Muslinger, and then the Spanish company uh, called RD Concretes. So the output and the impacts for the mussel production was uh, to ensure the stable seed production by having a new hatchery protocol. 
that was further developed from what Yola started off with. And here we were focusing on reducing the cost because as soon as you go into a hatchery, the cost for producing the seeds often goes up uh, <clears throat> compared to collecting of seeds in the wild. Uh, then we looked into this cultivation system of uh, being submerged tube and nest system, and it is currently being tested in an offshore wind park uh, in Denmark, uh, where we are testing multi-use in this area for aquaculture of uh, blue mussels. Uh, besides being a good fit for offshore conditions, you can also use it in coastal areas, where, especially in emerging areas where you're not used to having agriculture facilities because it will have less visual disturbance of the seascape. And sometimes people doesn't want to look at this if they're not used to it or it is a tradition in that area. So that was a kind of a side effect that was not intended in the first go. But having it below water reduces the visual disturbance of the seascape. And then uh, we also developed a protocol that is based on a non-toxic anti-fouling treatment of these calcifying worms. If you have biofouling on your blue mussels, uh, then or other bivalves, they can sometimes not be sold on the fresh market because the consumers doesn't want to look or eat these uh, organisms <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> that have these uh, biofouling on them. So in some areas, they are considered a waste problem because the mussels are just being discarded instead of used. But by reducing the biofouling, by using this protocol, then there are more uh, mussels going into fresh consumption. So the exploitable results from this uh, case study was a protocol for uh, hatchery production of blue mussel seeds that is online and can be found uh, on Sonora, uh, and the submerged uh, tube and net system that is now being tested in Denmark uh, further developed, and then there's the guideline or a guide uh, of how to manage this uh, biofouling of calcifying worms. And that was it for the mussel. Now we'll leave the floor to Ose. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so I'm Ose Strand. I work at IVL Swedish Environmental Research um, Institute, and I've been responsible um, for their oyster case study, which focused mostly on native oyster production in emergent areas. So oysters are one of the most produced uh, low tropic species worldwide. Actually, the one most uh, produced marine species. Uh, but we are focusing on native oyster species to increase the resilience of the industry, as Benile explained, and also on areas where oyster aquaculture is emerging activities. So as in case study nine with the mussels, we identified some challenges, um, and you will recognize some of them. It's a low end inconsistent seed supply in these emergent uh, areas. Also suboptimal culture systems, which are not adapted to local conditions and also low economic sustainability due to biofouling, which reduces the product quality and the economic viability of, um, of the production. So this is um, how we have been working uh, in the oyster case. This is actually also a very good illustration of my brain. Um, so it's intense. Uh, we've had so many interactions. We started with all the yellow partners. So you can see we've had partners both in North America and in Brazil. Uh, in, uh, in, in Namibia and also actually in South Africa um, and a lot of activities in, in Europe. Um, and then, of course, this has expanded. We worked a lot with industry. So I really want to highlight our external partners in the industry reference group, but they are too many uh, to actually state by name. Um, I think when I counted the last time, we're up to 10 to 12 industry partners that we are working regularly with. And this is because we have a large number of people working in the case study. But this is truly a team effort. Uh, Simone and Pancho, who are here today, Jefferson and Angela, uh, Johannes, uh, Irla, Colin. Um, it's not only me, but we're a team working on this together. Um, so address, to address these challenges, uh, because we are focusing on these emergent areas, uh, there's often not hatchery protocols um, for, uh, for the species we're interested in. Um, so, and the challenges are different between the different areas. So in this case, we started looking into hatchery production of native oyster species in Brazil. So this was done in collaboration with Simone and Pancho and also Marcia um, at Primar uh, that you already heard mentioned today. Um, 
so they've done an amazing job. Uh, they worked with so many different perspectives to look into the native species, Crassus diagazar, and see how we can improve the hatchery protocols for this species in Brazil. They have identified and isolated native microalgae species and developed grow out protocols, bulk production protocols for these native uh, species, and then implemented them into the production and evaluated the impacts on the larval production of oyster, uh, oyster seed. They also designed and uh, installed and evaluated a new water treatment system to handle the challenges uh, that this estuarine environment posed to the hatchery. Um, and they worked on the larval rearing protocols uh, for Crassostria gasar. Um, in addition to this, they could see that there were challenges in terms of larval, larval quality over the season. So they worked on conditioning uh, procedures. Uh, but in this case, in Europe, we're used to the temperate a situation with temperature controlling everything, but here, because it's a tropical area, uh, salinity is a more important regulating uh, factor uh, for maturation of the oysters. So they, they used experiments uh, to look at conditioning procedures uh, using salinity manipulation, which was very, very successful. So through all of this work, we worked a lot with capacity building, as I said, we, together with the industry, uh, we developed a range of new products, and the final outcome is actually significant improvements um, in the Primar hatchery. Um, they've increased the seed production of this native species significantly. So I'm super happy and very, very proud to be part of this work um, that I'm presenting on, on their behalf. Um, what you have to do also when you produce oyster seed um, in hatcheries is you often have to have a nursery system to transfer the seed from the very sheltered, very protected hatchery production into the grow out systems, which are sea based or, or uh, more open, in the open environment. So uh, the Primar hatchery also worked with implementing a low tech um, small scale nursery system with very good success. And this has also be a, been a very, very important step to increase uh, the seed production at the hatchery. Uh, and this system is uh, already implemented in the production uh, because the results were so good. In other parts in Europe, um, uh, an alternative to hatchery production where you don't have such a large industry uh, is to use spatting pond technology. And this was done together with IRLA uh, that you also had mentioned today. Sorry, I forgot to mention you before, but here you are. <laughs> Uh, so as Irla said before, he's been working with this kind of, of technology for 50 years. Uh, he's an expert in this. But the problem is that although there are a few actors who are using this technology and knows about this, um, there's very little documentation about this. Um, so what we set out to do was develop a protocol that enables tech transfer also to other industry um, who's interested in implementing the technique. So we had a good student who was working on the data that Irla and Colin had collected. And we also did a small scale experiment uh, where I work in Sweden. Uh, and we developed a protocol for both large scale pond production and also a, a smaller low tech system. Um, so there's a protocol available or will be very soon, as soon as I reviewed the final version um, that you can find uh, on the Aqua Vitae webpage uh, shortly. Through this work, we had a lot of interactions with European networks, uh, the NORA network, the Native Oyster Restoration Alliance, and there's a great interest from a lot of different industry partners uh, in this network uh, connected to restore, uh, restorative activities with wild populations. The final technique that we also wanted to, to work on uh, was sea-based seed collection, and this was done both in Brazil with Jefferson and Angela um, and Aliciene. Uh, and also in, in Sweden with our industry partners. So here we developed new types or we evaluated new types of seed collectors and compared them to traditional seed collectors such as um, the Coppels. And also we worked on developing protocols that would enable us to increase the, the capture of our target species, our native species. Because a common problem in all of these areas is that you have Pacific oysters, which is a non-native species, uh, and that confounds or impacts the settlement of the native species. Uh, we even used uh, artificial in intelligence and machine learning uh, to separate oyster species um, in an automatic way. Uh, again, impacts uh, capacity building through industry involvement uh, from very small scale to large scale. And also in some cases, this um, techniques have already been applied within the industry. So I think we did a really good job in terms of getting the TRL up. 
Uh, grow it systems, uh, we have uh, both uh, developed and tested new production systems, uh, both in Brazil uh, and in Sweden. In Sweden, uh, we had huge delays because of the <coughs> pandemic, so we only managed to design and test it uh, at research scale. Uh, but in Brazil, it's actually tested by the industry and it was so successful, uh, it's already in use. Uh, and Jefferson, I don't know, where, where are you? <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so they're continuing um, the work with this uh, new system and actually doing cost-benefit analysis and developing, and developing it into a product. Uh, finally, the Fallen treatment, which was done in collaboration with a muscle uh, case study. Uh, we actually identified optimal temperatures and exposure times to treat oysters for tube worm uh, fouling. Uh, we had high hopes to actually try this also in situ in the oyster farms, um, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we couldn't get that far. But that technique is demonstrated in a relevant environment, so that's TRL level six, um, and I think that uh, we made good progress. <coughs> So, in terms of exploitable results, um, as you can see on this slide, we have a lot of different products and prototypes. You can see the nursery systems, the grow out systems, the new microalgae species, uh, the seed collection protocol, and also the water treatment system at Primal. But we also developed a lot of protocols and publications, uh, the pond production protocol, the conditioning uh, manuscript, and also the fouling treatment. So now I'm going to hand over to Anton. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anton Salgado. I work in CSIC in Spain, Vigo, and I was in charge of uh, the byproduct uh, case study. We have this, or identified these two challenges. One of them is introducing viable aquaculture in the carbon circular economy, and the other one is towards a zero waste value change. This is uh, our network, it's not a big one like the other two. And we did not, did not cross the Atlantic. <laughs> we work uh, with uh, our colleague, colleagues in the University of Stellenbosch in, in South Africa, <laughs> colleagues in CCMAR in, uh, in Algarve in Portugal, and we in Spain, but have a close collaboration with OSA and with Pernil, and also with Nofima. Okay? So it's a not too big network. And we also have these uh, five. Uh, Industry reference uh, group, this, this group of five enterprises. Concerning the first challenge, which is um, viable aquaculture in the, in the carbon circular economy, we have these four <coughs> outputs. The first one is positioning shellfish aquaculture in the carbon circular economy context. This was a paper where uh, what we tried is just to introduce the idea that using the shells uh, in low carbon footprint applications, but at the same time that the CO2 in calcium carbonate is retained for a long time, say decades to, to centuries, this, this is not re uh, remove of CO2, but it is not release, which is also good. Huh? So it is not removed, it is really not 100%. Uh, <laughs> carbon circular economy, but it is 60% carbon circular economy, okay? The, the second uh, output is a methodology to the accurate estimation of the biological carbon footprint of shellfish aquaculture. This was because there was really a huge confusion about how, how to calculate that. So we did an effort to, to present a protocol that, that was published in in that journal, and uh, this was the protocol used to calculate the carbon footprint of uh, shellfish or bivalve in all the value change. Our third uh, output was a digital, digital twin. The idea was to simulate how the carbon footprint evolves from seeding to um, harvesting, you know, and then you can also play for example, this was applied to Galicia, to our area, because we know that if you seed in April, it is much better than seeding in September because the length of the culture period is lower, the temperature is different. So you can play in some way to look for the best condition to have a lower 
biological carbon footprint for your culture. This could be exported to other areas, but now it is just uh, it is a paper that it was submitted one year ago, the journal. I don't know what they are doing, but it is there. <laughs> the, uh, sorry. The fourth one is uh, returning Bible shells to sea to compensate the carbon footprint of cultural masses or uh, in general uh, of Bibles. <laughs> this is something that we are going to present to the Galician government, options to return the uh, shells to sea. First one is using it for beach restoration, is reducing the calcium carbon, the, the, the shell to fine muscle shell sand. And the other one, the second one is crusted muscle, so not reducing very much, and put it in areas of rocky outcrops. So you have, this is are in the outer part of, of our coast, so you can have a alkalinization reservoir in the beaches, but also in the outer part of the of the uh, our areas, our estuaries. Concerning the the second uh, challenge towards uh, zero wage value change, what we did was uh, to produce um, uh, two things. One of them was this uh, paint using calcium carbonate as a filler which works very well, same quality than the one using mineral calcium carbonate. And we also produce sustainable lime pellets, okay? A couple of products that uh, can be, you know, contribute to this zero, zero waste economy. Uh, we also make a valoriz valorization of fishery and aquaculture, <coughs> bivalve aquaculture, uh, side streams to obtain biocompounds particularly fish protein hydrolysates. So in the picture below, you have uh, fish heads from the market of Vigo. And on the other side, you have the hydrolysates that you can obtain at the pilot plant scale, which is the one in the upper uh, pictures. And with these fish hydrolysates, we use it as ingredients uh, to substitute fish meal in the aquifers of this uh, of uh, uh, gilt uh, head seaweed juveniles, with a very uh, good results. And uh, well, regarding the exploitable results, I have shown really then in the previous slides, but the ones that we have defined in Aquavite are the paint the protein hydrolysates, the protocol to produce the protein hydrolysates, and the aquifers. And apart from these exploitable results, which are particular of each of our case studies, we have contributed uh, several uh, exploitable results where all of us, the three case studies, were involved. This is some of them. I would like to highlight, for example, the one related to to see the, oh, to see it, I, I can't straight it. <laughs> well, the one in the, that's a, this is just uh, deliverables and reports where the whole value change contributed to exploitable results. There is also some, some more, like the quantification of the ecosystem services or the value, economic evaluation of them as well. And also, we contribute to the dissemination, participating in, in the promo video, in the MOOC, in the game, or contributing to the newsletter. And to finish, we have these three take home, uh, take home, take home messages. Uh, the application of new biological knowledge and new or adapted culture techniques and protocols uh, significant increase in production potential and sustainability of the Bible production. Uh, the integration of size stream contributes to sustainability and to the carbon circular economy. And uh, to fully take really benefit from all this work, we need to go a step further and uh, put it this, all of these things more into industry and upscaling the, the production is, is uh, needed. And uh, that's all. If you have any questions, you can ask uh, Bernil, Asa, and maybe me. <laughs>
Thank you. So we have got a, a little bit of time, so we're not going to let the guys off the stage just yet. Um, so do we have any questions or, or comments on the, the last couple of talks? Wait, wait, wait. This is all. Oh, I want to throw it. <laughs> wait. We just wait, we're gonna turn it on. No, you stay, you're not allowed to come forward. He's open. Go, let's see. Oh, you ready? You ready? <laughs> Been doing it all day. Um, Anton, uh, uh, Panil, and Osa, um, fantastic stuff. What about really upscaling uh, Bibel production globally? How are we going to make it grow and grow and grow more? <coughs> Use this mic, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, that's a very good question, and I hope that you um, uh, attend tomorrow because this is actually what we have been addressing in Work Package 6 where we have produced recommendations on how to achieve upscaling a low-tropic species aquaculture. So, just to keep the tension a bit, everybody join for the sustainability presentation tomorrow and you will hear all about it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, more questions? We want to throw that ball again. Here we go. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, a question for Anton about the, is this working? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about the using the muscle byproducts. So what percentage of the muscle production is not ready to go into the human food chain and therefore has to go into uh, sort of the fish meal or muscle meal? Well, the estimate is, is about 10%. 10%. In our area, but in our area is really the produ the production is here, so it is. I, I had those calculations somewhere, but yeah, it is about ten percent. Okay, so that can make it a significant. Yeah, it uh, makes sense to to yeah. do something with that. Excellent, thank you. So how do you apply artificial intelligence to uh, differentiate among the different oyster species? How did we apply what? Artificial intelligence, yes, sorry. Um, so we took pictures uh, of all the oyster seed um, and one, uh, the ones we could identify uh, by eye, we of course identified to the right species and the ones we were uncertain about we uh, sent for genetic analysis. And then we made this training data set uh, with known species, um, and we used uh, neural networks um, to train, uh, train the software. We have to talk with, because we, we, we make the, the same with fishes on oh. board of vessels, so maybe we can... Amazing. Did yeah. it work well? <laughs> okay, that's right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say that we actually got a hit rate of 96%, so it was really successful for the Swedish or the Pacific oyster and the Swedish uh, native flat oyster. Um, we have data collected also in Brazil, and we were hoping to maybe try to in implement that, but that's going to be the next project. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? <laughs> Yes, we do have a question online um, that it says, do you foresee an increase in numbers of hatcheries doing bivalves and echinoderms, mainly in, in Europe? Um, maybe we should hand the question over to Colin, who's a work package leader one and working with hatchery processes. Yeah, the question was, <laughs> can you please... Can you increase in hatchery production? The, the question is, do you foresee an increase in numbers of hatcheries doing bivalves and echinoderms? 
Yeah, we do see an increase in it. We will see it because what we're trying to prove is the fact that you can have a multi-species hatchery by using all, this, all these different techniques for the production of different species. So overall, what we're trying to do is develop capacity within the industry. So it's a case that we can show that an oyster farmer can then start producing a different species or, for instance, the urchin farmer can start producing macroalgae, for instance. So that's what we're looking to do is create this model for a multi-species hatchery not that you're producing just one species for one part of the year that you're actually producing year round. Overall, that's what the output we're looking for out of this. Maybe I can add to that. And in, in the oyster case, we also worked with mapping uh, markets in different parts of, of the Atlantic Ocean, everything from mature markets to emerging markets. And there we could see that the development of hatcheries are actually a key component to <coughs> expand and upscale the production. Um, so from that perspective, I also think um, that we will we'll see more hatcheries in, in the future. And I can maybe add, at least from a Danish perspective, that the focus on the effect of uh, claws and dredges on the sea bottom is uh, increasing more and more because of the focus on biodiversity. So I think that if I should foresee in the future, there will be a shift towards more aquaculture than uh, fisheries, at least for bivalves. Thank you. Okay, thank you. No more questions? Anyone? Throw the ball with left hand thread one more time. We'll be no. around. All right. <laughs> yes. and, and, and we are going to open up for a general discussion um, at the end of the afternoon. So we can open up the discussion again. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, we now move on to the final session. Uh, before we open up for general discussion. And um, I'll hand over now to, to Lucas, who um, will kick off with the, the fin finfish value chain. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Lucas Storati from Embrapa. I will speak a little bit about uh, freshwater finfish production in Brazil, basically uh, two species. Uh, but first of all, I would like to say thanks to Aquavita Project for all of this opportunity, to the European Union also for the funding, and for the key partners that worked with uh, Case Study 10, which is in freshwater fish, which are Nofima and UNESP, and I am speaking on behalf of lots of uh, researchers and colleagues who helped uh, strongly to, so today we can present the results we will present. Uh, <clears throat> uh, first, I will talk a little bit of these two species. The one uh, above is tabaki, is an Amazon species. is considered the second most farmed uh, fish in Brazil, using only four tilapia. Is the main native species produced in Brazil. Um, there is no problem with the reproduction of tambaqui. It's very easy to, to get tambaqui to spawn. It's not the case for the second species, uh, which is the arapaima. But farmers uh, still use not improved genetic material to produce uh, the fingerling. And, uh, also, another issue that has with the Baki is that there are several interspecific hybrids being produced. So when you think about aquaculture, it is like an environmental uh, issue. If we think that this uh, material can escape into the environmental, into the environment, and this can uh, cause issues in terms of environment. Uh, there is not today a specific feed for tambaqui that we use uh, to feed tambaqui with uh, herbivorous uh, feeds uh, uh, commercialized in Brazil. Uh, also, the main issue uh, for this species uh, that the industry reports is the presence of intermuscular bones which impedes the filleting of the, of the species. So today it's commercialized that like the whole fish, the half fish, some cuts like the ribs, but not the fillets. So it's considered a, 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 still a problem for the industry. 
I'm talking about this because this explains what we have done in, during the project. Going down to the second one, a completely different species, the Pirarucu or Apimagigas, is an Amazon fish, air breeder. It's not a low trophic species, it's a carnivorous one. So it's considered a, a novel species for the project. We work it, Sophia will, ta will talk a bit later about some trials we did to incorporate low trophic, speeds, uh, low trophic species into the feeds for this species. We have today the, uh, a very limited production of arapaima. So the reproduction, the control of reproduction of these species is today the main problem. So we can't scale up production because we can't uh, reproduce it in a controlled way. Farmers do today separate uh, couples in earth ponds, and uh, it's very tricky because uh, 10 years ago there, used, there were not uh, tools to identify the, the sex in the fish, so it, this is not a problem anymore. So today we can uh, identify sex, but we cannot promote natural reproductions, and we could not promote the collection of the gametes to attempt uh, artificial fertilization. So uh, the outputs from Aquavita were for Tambaqui, a protocol that enables uh, the production of 100% sterile fish, triploids. Uh, we did that using a pressure shock protocol. We optimized it through several uh, trials the parameters to achieve it. So the, the time post -fer fertilization where we have to apply the pressure and the duration of the pressure were optimized. So we have today this uh, protocol. This will contribute to the sustainability of the value chain. Uh, for Tambaqui as well, we did a very detailed study, very basic to identify the types of intermuscular bones, when they do appear, and we developed uh, a tool using x-ray so we can uh, identify the number, the length, and the types of the eye bones that in live fish. So this protocol can be used in breeding programs for the species, uh, and it's very basic. We currently don't have uh, an, a breeding program uh, for the species, but uh, the protocol is there and it can be useful to select fish with less uh, bones or with bones that are more easily uh, removable by the industry. For the Pirarucu, we could reach a method to collect uh, semen and we, based on that, we describe it for the first time the ultrastructure of the spermatozoa of the species, which is something unique. Two flagella, lots of mitochondria, which cor corroborates with the fertilization modes for the species. We now need to move forward uh, to cryopreservation protocols to improve the methods for collection of samples without uh, any contaminations, which will prevent uh, the development of, of such protocols. And uh, we did several trials on hormonal therapies, trying to stimulate uh, the reproduction of couples in earth ponds. We tried several uh, hormones, several uh, timings for application, uh, and this advanced uh, knowledge. We know now, for example, that application of uh, hormones like uh, acute applications, like injections, are very dangerous for the species, uh, very risky, while slow releasing in plants are very safe. We need to optimize this protocol so we can uh, reach uh, spawnings, inducing spawnings. So all of this will contribute to the sustainable production of the tambaqui and also the opening of uh, new markets for, for the species. Uh, we basically will 
uh, disseminate uh, our publications on, on this. Basically, the triploid production can be used by over 80 uh, farms that produce uh, fingerlings of tambaqui in Brazil. Uh, Embrapa has today a very incipient uh, breeding program for, for tambaqui, which can benefit uh, of the protocol for identification of the spines. Uh, although we didn't reach artificial fertilization for a rapaima, the development of this technique for semen collection definitely can help sex identification, which is still a problem for most farmers in Brazil. And this is a beginning of uh, the construction of a protocol for the control of the reproduction of, of the species. And we also advanced knowledge in terms of hormonal stimulation for the species. Uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, all of the of all of those who contributed to the to this work, my colleagues in Brazil, especially Phil James for coordinating Aquaviti, and uh, that's me. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Luis Sampaio from the University of Rio Grande in south of Brazil. Uh, I'm a case study leader for the marine uh, fish. And uh, we started this uh, project working with uh, flounder. Then with the pandemia, we had to change it for uh, another species. It's the, the southern uh, black drum, Pogonia scorbina. It's uh, a species that uh, had not been used for uh, aquaculture. Uh, so we started from, from zero, collecting uh, broodstock from the wild. And uh, for our uh, good surprise, within four or five months after they were uh, brought to the, the, the hatchery. We obtained uh, natural spawning from this fish. And uh, we were able to, to produce uh, juveniles in, with the first eggs that we, we, we obtained. So it was very different from our experience with uh, the flounder, which it took us a couple of years to get the first spawnings and uh, one, two years to get the uh, the, the juveniles going on. And uh, so it was uh, an interesting uh, challenge to, uh, to work with this uh, new species for aquaculture. It is distributed in southern Brazil, Uruguay, and uh, Argentina. So uh, all the uh, countries in the Atlantic in South America can benefit from this uh, species for uh, marine uh, aquaculture. And uh, so the, the main uh, challenge that we, we, we faced, uh, we, I thought we would be uh, facing, would be uh, obtaining the fertilized eggs and uh, getting uh, through with the larvae culture. And then for, uh, as I, I mentioned, it was a good surprise that uh, we were able to, to produce fingerlings in the, the very first year. Uh, so it uh, brought us uh, the opportunity to uh, go further and uh, study uh, uh, the, the production of these juveniles and uh, develop uh, uh, winning protocols. Uh, so we uh, had as uh, main objectives with objectives with uh, within aquavita uh, to improve the, the protocol for natural uh, spawning uh, uh, get a better uh, protocol feeding this larvae with a uh, roach and artemia uh, 
going then for a, a earlier period of uh, the, the weaning, which is a, a challenge for marine fish. And uh, we also studied the effects of temperature and uh, salinity on, on juvenile production. Uh, so it, we can, uh, with this new species uh, for marine fish culture, actually, uh, I would like to say that in Brazil, marine fish culture is very incipient. Uh, we produce a few tons of uh, cobia and uh, some grouper, but uh, there's not really a, a established industry. So uh, uh, we've been uh, searching for species, for uh, appropriate species for uh, marine fish farming. Uh, some uh, other uh, species have been investigated, and uh, this uh, specific uh, southern uh, black drum is very interesting as it is a sturine species, so it could be used uh, inland and also in the sturine regions for uh, for production. So that's and the, within the Brazilian coast to have uh, warmer and colder temperatures and further in Argentina even uh, colder temperatures so we were we were interested in the, the effects of uh, temperature and salinity and uh, we were able to um, to, to run this uh, experiments and uh, we ex expected that there is a, a big influence of both temperature and salinity on their growth. And uh, it uh, turned out to be a species that likes warmer water. They grow much better at uh, 30 degrees Celsius than at uh, lower temperatures. And uh, regarding salinity, uh, intermediate salinities, brackish water uh, also has uh, a good growth uh, response for, for its production. So, uh, and uh, the, we tried uh, this fish in the recirculating aquaculture systems and also in uh, uh, in ponds, and uh, we could grow them uh, to 700 grams in less than uh, one year, uh, both in in Haas and uh, in the ponds. So. It uh, is really a uh, very uh, potential species for for aquaculture. Uh, we also wanted to. This is a, a endangered species. It's been overfished in the in the last century, in the 70s, the, in the 80s. Uh, landings were around uh, 2,000 tons per year. And uh, by the turn of the century, it uh, turned into zero. So now this, this fishery is, is closed uh, in Brazil. And um, some uh, local agencies are uh, looking for uh, perhaps uh, using uh, these uh, captive fingerlings for stock enhancement programs. Uh, and. Uh, Natural spawning is not really the best approach for uh, producing uh, juveniles for stock enhancement. We might want uh, uh, artificial fertilization so, so we can assure a larger number of uh, broodstock participating in the juvenile production. So, so this last year, we were able to uh, induce spawning this fish and uh, just Last week, we were also uh, we made the progress uh, with a cryopreserved semen. <clears throat> we fertilized uh, the eggs with a cryopreserved semen, and uh, we had a nice uh, um, production of uh, fertilized eggs. So now we have uh, natural spawning, uh, induced spawning, and uh, what we call a semi-natural uh, spawning that. Uh, uh, broodstock that are induced to spawn, released in the broodstock tank, and they, they will, will naturally spawn. So we have the three approaches for uh, obtaining uh, fertilized eggs. And uh, we 
succeeded with the, the larvae culture. And uh, in the first trials, we had this fish uh, win it at the age of uh, 22 days after hatching. And then we, uh, the last summer, we uh, designed a, an experiment to, to make this uh, uh, earlier uh, winning. And we were able to, to stop feeding them on Artemia by 16 days after hatching. And uh, their, their growth was is lower compared to fish winded at 19 or 22 days after hatching. But uh, uh, 30 days later, we observed a comp compensatory growth that all, all juveniles were uh, at uh, uh, the same uh, length and, and weight. So, uh, and survival was not hampered by this earlier um, winning age. So we can really uh, win this fish uh, around 16 days after hatching. And uh, they, when they are uh, 50, 50 days, older, they catch up with uh, fish that are winded at uh, an older age. Uh, we also developed, uh, so the, with the protocol for cryopreserved semen, we studied uh, sperm quality and uh, with uh, another team at the uh, university, well, another university in, in Brazil, University of uh, Porto Alegre. So we, in, within a couple of years, we achieved uh, a lot of uh, results uh, for this species. Uh, so we are really glad that uh, we got into this uh, activity. And uh, as uh, results, specific results from uh, the Aquavite project, we have some uh, papers in preparation, one that has already been published and uh, fortunately, by, by, by the end of the year, we can submit a few uh, of those and maybe we have one or two for next year. Uh, so uh, I would like to, to thank the opportunity to, to participate in the Aquavity project. It was really interesting to, to meet uh, all this uh, good people working with a low trophic species and uh, I kind of got uh, contaminated <laughs> and uh, last year uh, as uh, Matt mentioned I was able to to start working with the sea cucumber and uh, we also achieved uh, good results with sea cucumber uh, so uh, I'm very happy with the, the work that uh, our team has been doing in, in Brazil <clears throat> Uh, for those of you that are not aware, we have a graduate program in aquaculture, masters and a PhD. Uh, we are open for uh, applications right now. So if anyone uh, is interested, have students interested to study in Brazil, there is opportunity funded by the Brazilian government. And uh, so we have have around uh, 50 graduate students in masters and the PhD. So anyone uh, wishing to cross the Atlantic uh, are welcome to, to come to the University of Rio Grande and uh, do some studies. We also have uh, uh, people with working with uh, uh, shrimp, uh, macroalgae, uh, uh, and uh, almost all all species in, in aquaculture and the sea cucumber now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Awesome. Okay, so good afternoon. My name is Sofia Engrola and uh, I'm from the Center of Marine Sciences in Portugal. I'll be the last presenter uh, today and I will talk about the use of low-trophic aquaculture species in feeds. 
So we, in this uh, case study, we were uh, 10, uh, 10 partners and uh, we were aiming at incorporating low traffic aquaculture species and aquaculture side streams, as I will show you, into aquafeeds to add value to the aquaculture value chains and to promote a circular economy approach within the industry. The partners have made several uh, nutritional studies to test these uh, new diets that we were uh, formulated. And we have tested uh, in uh, Avalon, the two species, European and South African, white leg shrimp, and in the marine fish like black drum and kilkati bream and freshwater fish and piraruku and tambaki. Uh, so uh, during uh, these years, we have made uh, more than uh, 20 formulations uh, with uh, different species and uh, for from all of these studies that we have made, we have identified uh, some diets that the inclusion of these new uh, mm. ingredients or supplements were really making a difference. So for instance, in the diets for white leg shrimp, we have included uh, microalgae as an ingredient or as an oil, uh, a fish oil replacement. For gilted sea bream, we have used muscle meal that was um, produced inside the consortium uh, for uh, fish meal replacement in gilted sea bream diets. In uh, Avalon, uh, both of the species, we have used uh, macroalgae as an ingredient, and in black drum, tambaki, and piraruku. <laughs> Uh, macroalgae was used as a supplement. In addition, we also were able to develop the process to produce the macroalgae originated from IMTA free of any disease. Uh, during this uh, impact of our work, uh, we have identified some lines that we have this impact. So in the part of sustainable production uh, patterns in food systems, uh, we also had the staff fact change that helped us uh, to um, calculate how we could reduce the environmental impacts by adding this new uh, low trophic species to the diets or side streams. Uh, since some of our diets were able, some of the formulations were really positive in the results, uh, we were able to substitute some fish meal and fish oil from diets, for, from commercial diets. All the diets were, uh, all the experimental diets were compared to a commercial like uh, diet. So this means that we are able to live, um, to have fish meal and fish oil and to be used in another uh, diets for other species or another developmental stages that are really needed. This will help us to increase diet flexibility that is very important nowadays and to um, to in to increase the part of the feed, uh, 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 higher feed security. Also, by including the low trophic uh, aquaculture species in our aquafeeds, we will open new markets for these diets and in a direct response to the society challenges and awareness that is uh, rising about the, um, um, the origin and um, the path that our uh, ingredients uh, will have until they are uh, offered to them to the fish or other species, of course. Uh, our exploitable results uh, at the moment we have several uh, some papers that are already published and others are in uh, preparation. So basically in these papers we will see all the formulations that were tested during the, um, during the process. We'll, you will see the ones that didn't work, the ones that are working, and we will explain uh, how these uh, diets are improving our uh, animals and our aquaculture uh, outputs. So it seems that you did so any change that I made in the slides. Okay. So Colin? Yes. 
<laughs> okay. So I was talking, and I think that I was already talked about this one. Have you? Did you hear this? That part? Yes. This one? No, that one I didn't talk. The other one before. <laughs> one. One more. No. Back. Back. Okay. We have a slight so delay. Can I change it from here? Okay. Yeah, try and take control and see. Yes, we would. <laughs> but then something happened. I don't know. Well, it's okay. I think that you have heard what I was talking about, right? Yes. Okay. So here it's. Uh, so as, um, we have made this joint presentation. So I will finish and wrap up the value chain. So you can see here synergies that uh, our uh, uh, partners had during the project. We have crossed the Atlantic from north to south. Now you don't see anything. Now you see again. Uh, from, uh, from north to south several times between continents. We were really transferring knowledge, uh, ingredients, supplements, uh, we had several meetings. Uh, we have debated almost everything that we could uh, remember to discuss. And uh, these uh, synergies that we had among the partners, I think that they were really positive and they were the one, the the part that make us have this so 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 nice results in the, this value chain. As uh, so a take home message, Colin, it's not changing. Can you change it, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, as the, um, as a take-home message, we are very happy with the results that uh, that we have. But uh, we always have uh, ideas how to continue to pursue even more. So we would like uh, to improve our protocols, to um, to test the triploids that we have made in the value chain of the freshwater fish at an industrial scale to implement the X-ray method in the breathing uh, programs. And we would like to advance the part of the CRIO preservation for uh, uh, a semen of Piraruku. As you know, they are quite large, so it will be very <laughs> practical. Uh, for marine uh, fin fish, uh, um, as a, it is a new species, so all the things that are involved in implementing a new species for aquaculture production are uh, are at the beginning, despite the, the very nice results that Louise has shown um, some minutes ago. So, but uh, larvae are difficult, so we would like to improve the part of the breeding protocol. The, they are the first ones in this huge cycle of aquaculture production, and they really need to have a high quality. And for that, they will need to be uh, well fed and have a suitable and tailored um, production protocol. In the part of the inclusion of the low trophic aquaculture species in aquifers, we know that the species that we were working, some of them may have other effects on the animals like microalgae and, and micro. They, will, they are able to change the antioxidant status and increase the resilience of the animal. So we would like to explore a little bit more of this functional um, effects that this new uh, species may have in the in the animals that we are feeding we also would like to um, to identify other methods of processing this low trophic species it's different if you use it uh, uh, broken if you extract it um, it's uh, there are different processes that you can use so it's a huge um, a huge area of uh, research and because of the so positive uh, results that we had with this inclusion of the side streams with the muscle mill we would like to identify more and like this to close the um, to close the cycle in this uh, circular economy approach thank you in behalf of all the partners involved thank you so much for our attention Okay, thank you very much, Sophia. And um, for the people in the room, I take full responsibility for the, the slideshow. Um, 
Uh, apparently, I wasn't supposed to touch anything, and I did, and I'm very sorry. But um, so we didn't see okay. all of the slides, but we heard you perfectly, <laughs> Sophia. Thank you very much, and it was very clear. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, so, sorry. So that brings to a, a close the formal. Um, part of this afternoon, the presentations that we've listened to. So thank you very much to all the presenters. Um, I think most of you are still here. I think all of you are still here. Um, so now we would like to, the, the, there are two parts to wrapping up this, this afternoon. The first will be opening up the floor for discussion. Um, so if anybody has um, any discussion points, um, please share them and we can maybe have a, a, a short discussion um, on, on sort of moving forward um, from here. And, um, and secondly, I'll hand over to Phil, who will, um, has got a few things to say, I think, in pre preparation for tomorrow, but we'll, um, we, we'll hold on that one for the next few minutes. Um, is there anyone that would like to uh, mention anything or open up the floor? Uh, for discussion, can we fire up our ball there? We can start throwing it around. I think there might be two. There's, a, there's another one at the back of the room that we could possibly fire up as well, and, and then we can... Do we have a question? We have a question. <coughs> that follows by you. Actually, I just want to try the ball, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, that wants it after you, so yeah. let's... <laughs> Uh, so my question is to uh, both Sophia, who's just spoken, and to the shellfish, perhaps, and even the algae, and something that uh, Adam referred to earlier. So I know in Norway they want to increase production of salmon from 2.6, I think it is, to 5 million tonnes at a conversion rate of 1 to 1. That's a lot of extra feed. So what do people think are the biggest bottlenecks to enabling low trophic species to be cultured as a feed component. I'm sorry, Phil. The, it was the question it was for me. So yep, yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, so let me see. It's not um, I don't think that the people or in this case, the society have any problem in including uh, micro macro algae in feeds. It's just that we need to understand that we cannot take something out and put directly the, the algae because the value is not the same. So it's a fixed 100. So you cannot take 7% of protein and put micro algae, for instance. So but we, what we can do in some in some of the species is that we can use them as a supplement and now we are studying it in the other in the other uh, um, species in the other projects and we know that imagine by adding something like uh, two percent of uh, a microalgae inside the diet we will have better results so we we can do these small changes and when i said that we could use them not using the broken cells for instance in the in the algae and use extracts or something like this we will uh, uh, use less and get more from the from the animals so it's not a problem it's easily accepted i think it's just um how you do it Uh, yep, that's, yep, I agree. But even um, if we look at 1% of 5 million tonne, that's a lot of tonnes. And I'm thinking maybe perhaps more of the, of the shellfish. What are the major, to, you know, to get economies of scale here, to increase to that sort of scale? Is that feasible? And what are the main bottlenecks, do you think? One of the things that we have seen, and Anton is also, and Luis are there, is that we all uh, we have tested the part of the muscle meal that was coming from the aquaculture side streams, and that's why I said that it was, it would be very nice if we could identify more that we could use then close the cycle, so we won't have waste. Uh, but we also had some from, uh, we can also see from the part of the hydrolyzides that, for instance, we were uh, testing from, from the case study um, uh, 12. So meaning that like the canning industry or, uh, you know, industry that is processing fish, 
or uh, like this uh, tail, um, frozen frozen fish, not all the parts of the fish are used. So we can uh, just catch these ones and put them again inside the, inside the cycles. I, I think it's just a matter sometimes of having the um, infrastructure because you need to have uh, a large amount of something until uh, someone will pick up and take it to a factory and will process it and all this. And sometimes if you have it dispersed and small amounts by different places, it's very difficult to collect them. Yes, It's logistic in reality. <laughs> yes, and I think from a shellfish perspective, I think it very much depends on the species, uh, but uh, one of the main thing for all species is the seed production and the uh, scale up of the production, especially for oysters uh, is a challenge because they are longer lived and often not Pacific oysters, they will work like a robot, right, Yella? <laughs> but for the other ones, the native ones are often more tricky. And then I also think there's an issue with getting licenses and uh, when you upscale production in areas or going into new areas or areas with not a tradition for producing the shellfish, then there can be a local resistance uh, against it because it changes uh, the perception of how to use the sea and how it looks like. Can I add to this? I also think that scale is a major issue um, because of what, and yeah, how will you be able to produce enough product for the feed companies? Uh, when everything is sent into food uh, at this point. Uh, and also, why would you prioritize feed, which has lower value as a producer? Why would you prioritize a low value product in, in, instead of a high value product, which the food items are? So what we have been discussing in work package six, a sustainability work package, is that maybe you need to plan uh, low tropic species aquaculture production according to the ecosystem services you want to achieve. So maybe you need to have uh, areas for food production um, which is a really good service from the low trophic species aquaculture, uh, but also maybe you need to have um, low trophic species or plan for low trophic species aquaculture in areas with a purpose of other ecosystem services. Mitigation of eutrophication, for example, and maybe those couldn't be sent for food, uh, but they could be used for other purposes. So, so there's a trade-off, you know, I think you, we just so need to be able to plan food. this a bit, uh, a bit better. Do we have any follow-on comments to that before we move on to a different topic? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you watched the way that the microphone was delivered to me, you'll know exactly why uh, New Zealand didn't make the, uh, the cut. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've got two questions. One of those are pretty much related to what we've discussed now. Um, the, the comment was made that for especially uh, shellfish, that we're looking at a lot of extra additional hatchery capacity. The question that I've got is that capacity driven by the private sector or by government? Because, um, you know, that's a, to me, it's always the question. Uh, if initially, initially, you don't have the profits in these kinds of things that in, in the private sector doesn't really want to look at it. If you're looking at, uh, you know, it being a sustainability thing, then obviously government needs to get involved. So that's the first question or, or comment that I've got to make is if we're looking at scaling this thing up, where are we looking to? How are we going to get there? Is it gonna, are we looking at the private sector or is it government or is it both? I would maybe add on that one to say, at least from a country where we are not producing or have a tradition to eat seafood a lot, it's very much the researchers that are approaching the industries to say, hey guys, you need to improve, you need to uh, uh, be innovative here because the systems you've been using so far is not efficient enough, uh, or you maybe want to have more species in your portfolio to be more uh, resilient because uh, more eggs in the basket, uh, some of them will survive. So I actually think there's a research perspective as well, as well mm. but it has to be in connection with the industry, or else it would just be collecting dust on the shelves at whatever researcher that has been doing it. Uh, 
Okay. Can I have another go while I've got this yeah. thing? Uh, so a very interesting um, research that was done was using the AI in terms of oyster, identifying the different species of oysters. A question I've got, because this relates to sort of environmental research done, uh, looking at mapping ecosystems, that kind of thing, is that kind of techniques, are we, do we know whether that kind of technique has ever been used in identifying uh, seaweeds? I don't know. Don't know. Yeah. I know it's used for microalgae monitoring, yeah. um, flow site bots. Maybe you know better? No. <laughs> no, actually, I don't know. <laughs> but I can also add on that one, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, for instance, in our hatchery, uh, we have the parasite bonamia, that is uh, a problem. Uh, and so far, we have been using P uh, PCR methods, taking smaller uh, cuts of the mantles. But now we are looking into eDNA, because then you can just collect it in the water sample instead, so you don't harm, have to harm or collect it, and it's more cheap in that way. So I think there's other ways than just uh, AI, but there's also other techniques that you can use. Just shortly, uh, mic microalgae are mapped often over with using drones or satellites, and their artificial intelligence is used to assess these pictures uh, and then training the system to kind of handle the larger pictures like satellite picture. I can refer you to a Norwegian project in uh, like called CB that provides all these drones and tools for doing that. Richard, can I follow up with a question to you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so, what, what exactly are you looking for um, in terms of identifying macroalgae using, is it species identification or why, what is it you want to identify using the AI? Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we're involved in a project where we're reseeding the ocean with abalone in South Africa. Now that's, uh, of a course, you have to do quite a lot of, uh, it's, um, we have to do baseline assessments. We've got 400 kilometers of coastline to cover. And in each of those sections, we have to go and do research work, which is very time consuming right at this moment because it, it requires photographing of quadrants, it's scraping, it's uh, manually identifying the makeup of those so that you have a baseline assessment to measure against in future to see whether there's going to be any drift off what your, your or what the ecological impacts are going to be. So what we are trying to do is to, what I'm trying to find is a way that we can streamline that whole process because that is a, you know, it's going to take years mm -hmm. and I don't have years. We, we've got okay. to get it done in a quite, quite a short time. Yeah. But then, you need to map the seaweeds. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. But that it, well, not just seaweeds, but, but that's the main component. Yeah, but then I think what uh, Michaela mentioned with drones, um, yeah. either airborne or uh, underwater drones, and also combination with Penelis' comment with eDNA, that would yeah. be a good way, way forward. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. But for assessing uh, biomass, that is what you need, and maybe seasonality, uh, I don't know, DNA is probably not the right tool, but really drones is something that we are working also with and really to map faster, I yes. mean, because 400 kilometers, yes, it takes quite a long time. <laughs> okay. All right, um, we, we're kind of reaching the end of, there we go. <laughs> Um, the end of the session, we, we're due to end in the next sort of four or five minutes. Um, is there time for another discussion or do you want to wrap up, Phil? Um, if there, is there anyone else that has a, another point that they'd like? Yes, we've got one right in the front. Come on. <laughs> yeah, my question, Phil, is to you. This morning you said, uh, when you were summarizing, Phil, about uh, you produced 16 publications and you fulfilled uh, some criteria for the project. In other words, a deliverable, 16. So presumably you only costed for 16 open access publications. And yet, through numerous of the presentations today, we've heard of many publications in the pipeline. 
So what's going to happen to them in terms of getting support for their open access publication? And maybe instead of, uh, if you have a, any kind of surplus, it could be prioritized towards those groups that need to get these open access publications out. It's just a thought. Well caught. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the 16 we mentioned, we said we were going to do 12. There's, I would say there's probably another 10 to 16 coming. How we deal with the open access, that we, we underfunded open access publications, to be honest. Um, yeah, that's something we can consider internally. Yep, sure. You can do self archiving. Yes, self self archiving, free open access. That doesn't cost us anything. For the people in the room, if they could speak to the cube, it would be much better. Otherwise, the people online could not hear. Thank you very much. I, I just pointed out that the commission requirement is for publications to be open access. They don't have to be gold open access, meaning we don't have to pay to get them published. We can do green open access, self-archiving, which doesn't cost anything. So we can have as many open access as we, as we want, but maybe we have to prioritize some of them to be gold, which is the... Well, the gold standard, uh, the, the most available one. Okay, brilliant. Listen, thank you very much, everyone. I think we're going to wrap up the discussion now. We're due to end in the next minute or so. It's been a long day. And um, I don't think we want to keep you here longer than we said we were going to keep you here. So I'm going to hand over to um, to Phil now to, to wrap up. Thanks very much, Phil. Great. Uh, thanks, Cliff, for uh, moderating today. You did a great job. Um, lots of similarities to the rugby here, lots of balls being chucked around, the TMO's voice coming out every now and then, remarkable. Okay, so the things that strike me just to sum up today, I guess, uh, there's some pretty recurring themes here, teamwork, transatlantic research, um, transdisciplinary, multi-species research, and I think I think one thing that strikes me in particular is the inclusion of South African and Brazilian. We have our Namibian partner here as well. It just adds this dimension to this EU project that is pretty special, I think, and it gives us the chance to do much more together than we would have done had it been just an EU project, for example. So, and I think some of the, this discussion at the end leads in particularly nicely to tomorrow with the discussion around AI, we're going to look at some tech um, tomorrow and consumer impact, e economic analysis, sustainability, education, policy advice, all things that kind of are what's missing in this discussion from today. So I think tomorrow is going to be a very interesting session and I welcome you back tomorrow and thank you very much for your participation today. Thank you. Bye. So, so that ends our online session, but